sure you take the right door on your way down. There's no telling where you might end up. Can you make it through? To the night's end. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Welcome back, friends. Last but not least, eh? I hope you have enjoyed all the stories so far. This is the episode to end the spooky season for the night's end. Thank you all for being here. Well, surviving this long. <laughs> A Trick Cemetery was written by Seth Augenstein. Performing this tale is Phoenix Fire, Erica Ventura, Rebecca Strazina, Kate Weigand, Steve Ragens, and James Barnett. A cemetery in the middle of the woods? Why? Said Annabelle, French inhaling from her cigarette. A beautiful abandoned mining town up the mountain. Said Trudy, staring the jeep into the curve, silver hammer and sickle earring tinkling. It's a ghost town that's supposed to be haunted. Cool. Said Bobby, flexing his muscles in the reflection of the passenger side window. Not sure how cool it is to disturb the dead, said Jenny, rubbing lotion into the raw tattoos on her right arm. They might get mad, you know. It's just for a bit of fun, said Jared. It's an adventure. It sounds like the Tales from the Yawning Portal campaign. Four of them rolled their eyes at him, and they all (laughs) laughed. I wish you'd shut up about your goddamn Dungeons and Dragons games said Jenny, punching him in the right arm. Maybe you could roll a d20 to see if you get laid before college. I'm not a virgin. I told you about my girlfriend from out of town. Okay, okay, let's all lighten up. Save your moxie for the seance. And at this, everyone laughed, (laughs) except Annabelle, who rolled her eyes and tucked on her cigarette. From the car CD player, Fiona Apple crooned about sleeping to dream, on and on, and on. After the bell rang at school, they had driven in Trudy's Jeep up the ridge into the colors of the October foliage north of town. The car pulled off the road into the Wildcat Ridge Wildlife Management Area, and Trudy parked it in the shade of an old oak tree. The teens all got out and took their backpacks out of the back and started up the trail. Annabelle tucked her American Ballet Academy sweatshirt into her sack and brought up the rear. The crisp smell of decay hung on the unseasonably warm air. They were sweating in minutes, removing sweatshirts and hats quickly. Even in the mid-afternoon sun, the hulking ruins of the structures alongside the path were shadowy, monoliths inscrutable. Bobby stopped to pick up a six-foot tree limb that he used as a walking stick. Jared did the same, with something half the size and stumpy. Jenny laughed at this, holding up her pinky finger. Jared stuck his middle finger up at her in trade. It's amazing to think that there was a whole town that vanished up here said Annabelle, gesturing at the rubble of a broken foundation that they passed. Silence descended over them. The road was now far behind, and it was only their steps on the fallen leaves which marked the autumn woods. Annabelle heard her breath echoing in her ears when something clamped down on her arm. It was Jenny, who leaned in close as they walked. Do you know what you're going to do? Yeah, since we talked an hour ago, I solved the biggest problem in my life, Jen. I just forgot to update you. Don't be snide, Belly Bell. You just have to know I'm here for you. And so am I, said Jared, coming up from behind them, an arm around each of their waists. I'll always be here for you, Annabelle. 
You know that. What are we talking about? Yes, I know you're here, Jared. She said, disentangling his hand from around her waist, then patting his flabby arm. But this is girl talk, and you're too manly to hear it. His face lit up. He nodded and then ran ahead to commiserate with Bobby, the other dude in the group. Boys. These are just boys. Jenny squeezed her arm. Have you told Mr. Silverberg that it's his? I haven't even told him I'm pregnant. Jenny put her arm around her friend, and they trotted along to catch up with the other three. The mining operation was the biggest in the New World for centuries, said Trudy, right as the trail took an upward incline. This is where they smelted all the ore for the American Revolution. There were homes up here, and there were bars and brothels and schools. It was the American dream, right here on the mountaintop. Hibernia, New Jersey. A thousand souls called it home less than a century ago. Now look at it. They were passing the hugest rampart of all, stone walls standing almost seven feet in height, bites taken out by the wind in the years. A lattice of two-by-fours covered the entrance. A sign said, Keep Out, in big block letters. Here, we have the biggest mine shaft of all. The Hibernia Hole, they called it. Right over there, is the remains of the sole chapel in the entire settlement. The Catholics among them set it up next to the entrance, so the miners could say prayer before they went in. I guess they needed it, said Bobby, picking up a huge hunk of the foundation, turning it over in his hand. More than you know, Bob, said Trudy, leading them up the mouth of the cave. Because the very success of the Hibernia Hole is what led to its tragic undoing. Jenny, at Annabelle's shoulder, leaning close. Where does she get this shit from? She whispered. You see, continued Trudy, the mountain under Hibernia became totally cut through with holes, like a gigantic hunk of Swiss cheese. To this day, there are sinkholes just waiting to swallow someone up, anywhere out between the trees. But back then, the whole thing was totally unstable, just waiting for the first crack to shatter completely. Trudy pointed around at her friends and then turned back to the mouth of the mine. In the small hours of October 20th, 1911, 13 miners were working hard at the bottom of the shaft, deep below where we are standing. They were using explosives. Hey, isn't today October 20? said Bobby. Unbeknownst to those miners, Trudy said, continuing, ignoring. Around that shaft, just thin layers of rock held back millions of tons of water, which had collected in the other abandoned shafts. At 1 a.m., one blast was just too big. It cracked that sliver of rock, and the seal was broken. The water came flooding in like an unholy, unnatural tide. The thirteen men had no chance. Within a breath, the shaft had become a death chamber. As soon as the news of the accident was known, every man and woman in this little town rushed to the scene. In the chill early morning with the rain falling in torrents, they clustered helpless about the mouth of the shaft, the weeping, hysterical women, relatives of the victims, imploring the men to do something. But there was never any real hope of rescue. The pumps were rigged as soon as possible, and desperate hands kept them going without a moment's pause. But it took days and the waterlogged corpses were found far too late for the snuffed lives within. Their faces were still stuck in images of horrified rage at the precious air which had been ripped away from them by the greedy mine owners. When they drained the cavern and investigated what had happened, they found a curiosity. 
One word stabbed into the rock nearest the hand of the newest man on the crew. Revan. Their names were David Slate, Joseph Swenty, George Pollock, Andrew Miscochet, John Manister, Paul Ketra, Joseph Swingler, Michael Najok, Michael Compos, Stephen Maida, George Kermis, Joseph Luskonka, and Eugene Fauchivi, the new man who had apparently etched the one strange word in his final breaths. A bunch of hard-working immigrants, it sounds like, said Jared, nudging Bobby with an elbow. So this is where they died, Trudy said, ignoring him. And we are going up to see where they are buried, in St. Patrick's Cemetery, the cemetery of the ghost town once known as Hibernia. Let's see what the dead can tell us. Trudy walked down the trail. Jared snickered. Jenny just shook her head. Why the hell is she talking like this? She whispered. I'm a little hazy on what the plan is, Trudy. Called out Annabelle, trotting to catch up to the leader. What was this you said about a seance? Why, yes, Belly Bell said Trudy, squeezing her friend's arm. We're going to use a method of contacting those working-class heroes who were cruelly murdered by neglect so many years ago. We will offer them absolution and solace, nearly a century after their tragic end. They hiked in silence once again. Eastward and upward, the trail continued on and on. Jared twirled his thin stick and chattered a bit at Annabelle, who offered some terse replies. Bobby swung his huge tree limb like a baseball bat, mine seemingly elsewhere. Jenny softly hummed some of the goth songs she loved so much, and Trudy kept shaking her compass. The sun arced, and the air a sharper, cooler, uncertain turn toward an autumn evening. Annabelle put on her American Ballet Academy sweatshirt. We should have been there a long time ago, said Trudy. I don't understand it. There's supposed to be a clearing at the end of the path heading east, and that is the cemetery. I'm just glad we started out early, said Annabelle. Hopefully we can get in and out before the sun sets. Hey, said Jenny, pointing just around the next bend. Check that out. They all looked ahead, and they saw a sign. The sign said, Atric Symmetry. Atric Symmetry? Said Bobby. Well, I'll be damned. Said Jared. The land of the dead. And indeed, within moments, they were in the clearing which opened up suddenly to show the expanded forest floor littered with broken and tilted tombstones, haphazardly erected amid a slight downward slope roughly the size of a football field. The tombstones were at least a hundred years old, and they looked even older in the low light strained by the late afternoon canopy. The etched letters were still readable, but they were worn smooth leaving only a few more years of legibility before they too would be wiped clean by the elements. Hey! shouted Jared, running his hand over the breast of a ruined angel. I think we found the saddest spot in the whole world. Jenny stood by a strange cenotaph. A worn, smooth figure, a miner apparently, cast out of stone, welding a sharp pick right at the height of her shoulder. It bore no features under its huge helmet. The statue seemed indistinct, unearthly in that shimmering half-light. There isn't a stranger cemetery this side of hell, she said, testing the edge of the stone with her fingernail, hissing and recoiling from its sharp prick of her flesh. Annabelle came to a crooked cross stuck in the ground. It had no name and no dates. 
It protruded at an obscene angle three feet from the soft dirt of the strange forest. Something about that angle, the fortrightness it assumed to aim skyward, set her heart racing, a shimmer of panic pulsing through her innermost being. She stepped quickly back and tripped over something. She toppled backward, right into the embrace of Bobby. He caught her with his free arm, holding her for just a moment. Lucky I was in the right place at the right time, he said, grinning down at her, then setting her down on her feet. Thank you, I have no idea what came over me, she said, glancing down. She had tripped right over a toppled tombstone, huge and settled flat to the earth like a tabletop. She squinted, and in the waning autumn glow in the forest, she could make out the name, Eugene Falsiwai. Winner, winner, chicken dinner! Hollered Trudy, clapping her friend on the back. You found it! This is the place! What do you mean this is the place? Asked Jenny. Like, are we here just to do some genealogy while we're traipsing through this overgrown boneyard? Trudy set down her backpack and rifled through its contents. She selected a long, thin box. No, sillies. This is the 13th man. This is where we're going to perform the seance. Trudy held up the box. It was a Ouija board. Emblazoned on the cardboard box underneath the gothic font was the big blue Hasbro logo. Not sure if a Ouija board you get from a toy store counts in the category of seance, honestly, said Annabelle. It's not the tools you use, it's how you use them. At least, that's what this one warlock told me on AIM the other day. Trudy removed the plastic wrapping and the price tag, $13.47, then opened the box. She set the board down on the rough stone. Then, she sat, legs folded underneath her, and smiled up at her friend. We're burning daylight. Come on down, she said, holding her hands out. Indeed, as the friends all sat down on the leaf-strewn ground around their tombstone, the autumnal light seemed to take a final dive toward night. The dusk chill settled around them, seemingly in an instant. Jeez... Wish I'd brought an extra sweater, said Jenny. (laughs) I can keep you warm, said Jared, cackling, folding her in his arms, which she abruptly pushed away. Let's just do this little stunt and hike back, said Annabelle, looking at the high dark clouds which had drifted over them. Because I think a storm's coming. They all looked up. The ripe clouds were unmistakable. Yes, do your thing, Trudy, said Bobby, tapping the walking stick lightly into his palm. Don't know if it's a good idea to be out in the rain on a mountain full of holes. A holy mountain, (laughs) said Jared, cackling. Trudy pulled three thick candles out of her sack, lit them with a black zippo, and placed them in a triangle around the board. If any of you have done this before, you know that we need to keep contact the whole time we are talking to the spirits, said Trudy, tapping the oversized teardrop-shaped piece of the Ouija set already on the board. We ask questions, and then our hands guide the planchet on the board to channel the answer from the great beyond. Jared scoffed. Who wrote your script? Wes Craven? (laughs) Ha ha! Smile melting from her face, she reached over and slugged him in the arm with a resounding thump. Jared yelped in pain. The smile reappeared on her face. There is one difference to our little ritual, she said almost sheepishly. She pulled out a huge shining hunting knife, which glinted in the candlelight. We need a little blood to jumpstart things tonight. (laughs) Jared laughed, the only one of them to do so. 
but his laughter died in his throat when he saw Trudy's intent stare at him. What are you, a coward, Jared? She said, holding the knife handle out for him to take. Your virgin blood would be perfect for this ritual. Everyone knows that girlfriend out of town bit is bullshit, said Jenny. But if you're a coward, I'm not sure who else here qualifies. Everyone looked around. Bobby shrugged apologetically. Trudy scratched at her hammer and sickle earring. Jenny pointed at Jared, who just kept shaking his head. The moments of silence were broken when Annabelle leaned forward and grabbed the knife. How much blood do you need? She said, pressing the point to her palm. Belly Bell, you... Said Jenny. I said, I just want to know how much blood Trudy needs to complete her little ritual. Said Annabelle, lips pursed, and Jenny looked away. Just a single drop, Belly Bell. Your blood would be perfect. Jenny was watching her, and Annabelle gave her a surreptitious wink. She pressed the point of the blade into her palm. A pang of pain and a bit of blood welled in her palm. She turned her hand over in a trickle. One and two, three, four, five, splattered on the cardboard below before Jenny lunged forward with her scarf. What the fuck? She said, wrapping the fabric around her friend's wound. I'm thinking we need to get a move on. I'm cold and it's going to rain. Let's see what Trudy can do if she needs the blood of a virgin. Okay, everyone. Hold hands. We need to keep an unbroken circuit around the board. I thought you said we needed to keep our hands on the... Planchette? Said Trudy, reaching out her hand. No, we don't need that. I never said we need to keep contact with that. This ceremony's a little bit... different. They all looked at her her outstretched hands, her waggling thin fingers. Trust me, she said. Annabelle was the first to grab Trudy's right hand, and then Bobby grabbed Trudy's left. The others followed suit, and the circle was complete. The planchette jerked to life on its own. It pivoted with a horrifying deliberation, and then started moving in a strange, elliptical orbit on the board like a carnivorous fish in a tank. Annabelle's heart raced, and Jared moaned in a high-pitched voice. What the fuck? said Jenny. Presents from the other side, said Trudy, her voice husky and theatric. Please tell us who you are. The planchette did another little pivot, and it started to move around the board to let her after letter. Unbelievable, said Bobby. Ah! Moaned Jared softly. Shh, said Annabelle. Spirit, Trudy called out. Who are we speaking to? The marker started to spell E U G E N E. Incredible said Bobby. Ah. Moaned Jared, eyes rolling in fear. Shut up, counseled Jenny. Hello, Eugene Falshi. We have wanted to speak to you for a long time. Can you tell us where you are now? H-A-D-E-S You have to be kidding me. We're talking to someone in hell. Hades, said Trudy, dipping her head to wipe her brow with her shoulder. Hades is the Greek underworld. It's not what the Christians envisioned as eternal punishment. Rock outcroppings, mist, lots of rivers, endless tasks, but not limitless suffering. This is what all the spirits say. How many spirits have you talked to recently? Asked Annabelle. Trudy just smirked. She continued. Why are you there, Eugene? She asked. 
the plane Chet moved letter after letter. Because a little blood. How much blood? Yours is perfect. Jared howled, then pulled back from the circle. Ah, I'm out of here. He stumbled to his feet, stumbling into the crooked cross, which tipped with a low groan, and then suddenly fell away from the group. Some of them jumped. But Jared was already yards away, running back in the same general direction from which they came. The friend screamed at him to stop, to wait, to calm down. But Jared was already far ahead, and he had missed the path. He plunged into a thick line of trees. Over the friend's shout, they heard his frantic footsteps, then a short yell. Then nothing. Moments later, Bobby reached the tree line and called back to the group. He's gone. He just vanished, he said. They searched in the growing darkness, foot by foot, and each inch. Annabelle nearly fell before being caught again by Bobby. It was a sinkhole that was about three feet in diameter. Trudy took a big rock and tossed it down, and they held their breath while they waited to hear it hit the bottom. There was only silence. Oh, shit. What are we going to do? Asked Bobby. What are we going to do? He's got to be down in the mines. We can get into there from the Hibernia hole. I know another entrance. Are you crazy? That's the worst idea. We should get back to the car and call the cops. Annabelle looked around. Wait. Where is Jenny? They backtracked toward the ritual site, where they found her. She was slumped underneath the minor cenotaph. Annabelle started to pick her up. Her neck and clothes were soaked in blood. She had apparently run blindly right into the path of that sharp stone pick and had sliced her throat open. The blood flowed fast, but she still breathed in heaving gasps. We have to get her back to the car and drive her to the hospital. But what are we going to do about Jared? Shouted Trudy. We have to get out of here, said Bobby, nodding at Annabelle. We'll get help and send him back for Jared. But before he finished speaking, something heavy thumped the ground beneath them. The three friends whirled around. Amid the gloaming, the statue shuffled down off its pedestal. One, two, three steps. It crashed through the brush. It was weighted down bulky. It raised its pick slowly over its shoulder. Bobby shouted and stepped forward, cocking his huge walking stick for a strike. Make a run for it! We can't leave Jenny! But Jenny had stopped breathing. The figure shuffled forward another massive step. Jenny's already dead. Follow me! Said Trudy, yanking Annabelle deeper into the cemetery. There's a shaft on the other side of the graveyard. With Bobby right behind, they dodged between the stones and through the gnarled vines and undergrowth. The footsteps kept pace behind. Short rows of stone popped up from the leaves, and the teen staggered through the rows. But Trudy fell. Annabelle and Bobby stopped and turned around. Her foot was buried in a circle of white debris. That's my ankle! Trudy yelled, flailing her arms. Save yourselves! Go! Go! Bobby and Annabelle saw the advancing figure. They glanced at one another and nodded. Bobby cocked his stick like a baseball bat, and Annabelle stooped and picked up two large stones. She wound up and threw the larger of the two, which hit the figure's helmet with a metallic plunk. The thing hesitated mid-stride but kept moving forward. Annabelle threw the second stone as hard as she could, and it missed entirely. She grabbed a tree branch about the length of her arm and moved to her left to flank the creature. Bobby moved to the right, 
far out and around. Trudy tried to get to her feet, but fell back on the ground. Just save yourselves! Hollered Trudy. Not today, said Annabelle, readying her first swing. But Bobby did something unexpected. He did a stutter step forward and pegged his sharp branch with an abrupt javelin throw that would have made his coach proud. But even more unexpected was the way the figure caught the blazing spear with a raised spectral arm. And then, in one fluid motion, flung it back, end over end, back toward Bobby, who was impaled through the chest. His eyes boggled. He fell backward, dead before he hit the ground. All was silent. The shadow turned toward Annabelle. Annabelle dropped her stick, grabbed Trudy's arm, and pulled with all her strength. Trudy shrieked, but her foot came free, and then she was upright and limping alongside Annabelle. Fifty yards on, the crunching footfalls of their pursuer were fainter, and after a hundred yards down, a gentle slope they came to an opening in the hillside just high enough for them to walk into. This is it. Trudy whispered, pointing inward. Annabelle flicked her lighter and, guided by the flame, stepped slowly inside. The musk of a hundred years struck her nose. Her steps echoed faintly in the far-off blackness. Her breath echoed in the black. Trudy's panting, too. After twenty yards, something smacked the back of her skull, and she collapsed. She awoke with the flick of the lighter inches from her face. The flame drifted away a bit and ignited a torch, which floated to a sconce on a stone wall and settled there. Once settled, the flickering cast a warm glow around the small chamber carved from rock, buttressed with ancient planks of wood. Annabelle blinked. Her eyesight sharpened. The firelight illuminated Trudy's smiling face. What? Annabelle murmured, rubbing her head. Good, you're awake, said Trudy, her voice sounding different, deeper, older. Now we can begin the fun. Two exits, one at either end of the chamber, beckoned. Annabelle stumbled to her feet and staggered toward a passage away from the light. But she stopped short when she saw the shadow standing there, immobile. It was a huge figure. The form that had chased them before. The form that had killed their friends. Annabelle leapt back. I almost forgot to tell you. Don't try to make a run for it. It's only those chalk incantations keeping Eugene out. Annabelle glanced down at the bright lines of the magic barrier, the strange ruins among them, and backed slowly away. What is this, you crazy bitch? said Annabelle, not turning from the dark figure. Oh, nothing much. (laughs) We're just raising the dead, conjuring a little justice from beyond the grave. Trudy grasped her shoulders from behind. You see, these miners died a horrible death, all because the boss of the mine didn't protect his workers. Yet, he was never punished. Trudy started nudging Annabelle ever so slightly forward, towards the doorway. No, the owner lived his life all the way down to the nub, and had many children and grandchildren. Trudy pushed Annabelle forward now moving her persistently toward the figure. His people are still all over the area, some with different names. They're on the town council, and they're in the church consistories and working at stores in the downtown. Now Trudy shoved her, hard, but Annabelle dug in her heels, then spun to face her. And 
There's even one who's graduating from high school very soon with a ballet scholarship to a prestigious Manhattan Academy. But that stupid great-great-granddaughter couldn't keep her legs closed. She went and got herself knocked up by the perv English teacher her senior year. Annabelle's face twisted. Trudy did a mock mine crying face, twisting her knuckles at her eyes. Boo-hoo, right? Yes, everyone knows about your little predicament, Belly Bell. Jenny wasn't such a good friend after all. That bitch was telling everyone behind your back. I'm surprised it wasn't in the school newspaper by now. (laughs) But bless that bitch's black little goth heart. That's also how I knew that you were a perfect addition to my plans. You see, it wasn't virgin blood which was critical for that ancient Carpathian ritual. Instead, the exact ingredient was... The blood of a pregnant woman. She shoved Annabelle again, drawing her within three feet of the line separating them from the creature. Annabelle's head swam with everything her erstwhile friend was saying. But why? What are you trying to do? Kill all your friends and do what? Fuck your dead lover boy? Trudy stopped in her tracks and did a little golf clap. Not bad for an airhead ballerina. Basically, Eugene Falshi was a good person, a working class immigrant, and he got the shaft from your scumbag forebear. I figured what better way to mete out justice. I can give him his revenge by making sure he has another shot at existence. He never even had time to finish the work before he was drowned all those years ago. She pointed at Annabelle's abdomen, and she smiled. Annabelle shook her head. I will raise that baby for you. I think I have the perfect name picked out already. That's ridiculous. You're insane. Trudy came at her and was going to give her a final shove toward the doorway. But with the grace of 10,000 practice maneuvers, Annabelle dodged her and flung Trudy's momentum at the doorway, where the friend staggered over the line of symbols and right into the waiting arms of the figure. Trudy screamed. The miner wrapped huge arms around her in a horrible embrace. The scream choked off as the air was squeezed out of her, and Annabelle heard the sickening crack of ribs and spine. It went on for a half a minute before the figure dropped Trudy's crushed body. There was a moment of silence. Sickening silence. Annabelle breathed. But she noticed that the line on the ground had been disturbed, kicked away in Trudy's graceless tumble. The figure stepped forward into the chamber, drawing out the pickaxe from its belt. Annabelle grabbed the torch from the sconce and ran back to the other exit. The passageway was dark and narrow and wandered down an incline. She shivered with a subterranean chill as she plunged farther, further, deeper. Finally, a breeze rustled her hair in the darkness and her footsteps echoed out farther and further. Flickering of the torchlight showed a long high shaft stretching up above. She was at the bottom. Some white apparitions flickered in the shadows. She brandished the torch at them. Bones. Entire skeletons. She knew at once. The townsfolk had never even bothered to remove the bodies after the disaster. They just shut the mine and waited for the drowned immigrants to rot. Some of the bones were scattered, but there were about a dozen set of remains. One was particularly intact. She brought the torch closer, and she saw that it wore a crucifix which had been turned upside down. 
Over the skeleton's shoulder, in the rock, was the etching of the drowning man. Revan. But she leaned in and brushed away at the end of the etching. Soot and grime crumbled away, showing the rest of what the man had written with his dying breaths. Revenant. She turned away, and the torchlight showed a ladder leading up. The echo of footsteps grew louder. She dropped the torch and climbed fast, as fast as she could. She made it five steps before the pickaxe plunged into her heel. She screamed. Ah! And the miner yanked downward in the impelled limb, tearing the Achilles tendon. She howled Ah! and kicked out, and the pickaxe dislodged. She hopped up two more rungs using her good leg. The pickaxe swung again, and she felt it swoop past her ankle, and then it connected with the rock, which cracked. Then, whoosh, the onrush of water, the crash of flood. The torchlight vanished, and in the dark, she heard the water rushing, gushing, pooling. The miner's hand brushed across her good hill twice but she kept hopping. The water kept rising, and she kept pace ahead of it, above the surface of the flood. Her good leg felt like it was burning, but she kept skipping from rung to rung, her strong good leg working hard. She cried as the ruined ballet leg drained blood. She called out for help, which echoed out into the darkness of night above. Yet, she ascended. But as she kept clamoring from rung to rung, she felt a strange twitch down low in her abdomen start to stir. You've been listening to the Night's End podcast, Halloween 2022, which is a production of Dissonance Media. A Trick Cemetery was written by Seth Augenstein. Seth Augenstein is a writer of fiction and nonfiction. His debut novel, Project 137, was called an involving, tense and visceral near future thriller by Kirkus, and it won a reader's favorite award. His short stories have appeared in more than a dozen magazines and fiction podcasts including Writer's Digest, The Grey Rooms Podcast, The Molotov Cocktail, and others. He was also the editor of Forensic Magazine, a tour guide at the James Joyce Centre, and a student in St. Ballow's final class. Now he lives on a rocky ridge in New Jersey with his wife, daughters, dog named Mishima, and cats. His next novel, Llama with a Gun, will be published in 2022. The narrator was performed by Phoenix Fire, Trudy was performed by Erica Ventura. Annabelle was performed by Rebecca Strazina. Jenny was performed by Kate Wigand. Jared was performed by Steve Ragens. Bobby was performed by James Barnett. Links to all these wonderfully talented people are in the episode description. Please do check them out. The Night's End Halloween theme was composed by Duncan Muggleton. This episode was edited and produced by James Barnett. Stay horrific, everyone.